recording on this one. Okay, so uh, yeah, I'm recording this video now. Um, yeah, I will repost these videos uh, on iCollege as well. So uh, it'd be great if you guys could come here during class time so you can ask questions. But if you miss it for whatever reason, you can rewatch this. Okay, so with that said, uh, let's do a quick talk about uh, induction. So let me get to the screens I want to. And this is more or less going to kind of echo what I've talked about on the recorded version, uh, but this is better because you guys can ask questions back. So let me share. Okay, so you guys should see my PowerPoint presentation right now. Just someone, someone verify to me that you can see it. Just one yes in the chat would be great. Yes, awesome. Okay, cool. So, verify induction. <clears throat> so, induction is a lot like dominoes, right? And I'll explain what I mean. So, <clears throat> let's say that you have uh, an infinite line of dominoes, right? Infinite in the sense that you have domino one, domino two, domino three, domino four, and so on and so forth, and it goes on literally forever, okay? And let's say that you, like, what conditions would we need so that every domino falls over, right? Well, obviously they have to be standing up first, but let's assume they're all standing up, they're all on the perfect line. Um, what conditions would we need so that we can guarantee that with one push, every single domino falls over, right? One push, uh, pushing a domino this way. Well, you would need it first, you would need to push over domino one, right? Because if you pushed over domino four, that would just be domino four, domino five, domino six, and all that stuff falls over. So you would need, first and foremost, that domino one falls over, right? This is what's known as uh, the base case. Base case. This is what's known as the base case. Uh, <clears throat> so that's step one. Step two is you need to guarantee that if domino one falls over, then domino two will fall over, right? Maybe they're not close enough, right? So you would need to guarantee that if domino one falls over, then domino two will fall over. And you would need to guarantee that if domino two falls over, then domino three will fall over. You would need to know that if three falls over, then four will fall over, and so on and so forth. And in general, you would need to show that if domino k falls over, then domino k plus 1 will also fall over, right? Uh, k, this is for every k bigger than or equal to 1, right? You would need to show that for every, that if domino k falls over, then domino k plus 1 will fall over as well. If you can show that these two things will happen, then you can guarantee that all the dominoes will fall over, fall over right? That makes sense. This is essentially uh, what induction is. This is how uh, induction arguments work. You prove something about like a base case that some property happens with like your first domino or the first case that you're looking at, and then you prove that for every k, if k happens, property k happens, then property k plus one will also also happen. Okay. So that's the general idea behind uh, induction. So, <clears throat> again, induction only works when you're trying to prove a universal statement and you have a starting point. So, for example, in the previous domino example, we start with domino 1. Domino 1 was where we started. It could start with number 2. It could start with number 5. It doesn't, or it could start with negative 77, just as long as there's a starting point and it goes up. So, <laughs> induction arguments are used for proving things like this. For every integer n bigger than or equal to a, so this is the universal part, this n bigger than or equal to a, a would be your starting point, whatever a is. Starting point. Okay, so a is just your starting point. So for every, for any integer n bigger than or equal to a, some property about n, uh, maybe domino n falls over, or whatever the property is. So you use induction to prove these types of statements generally. So, 
first step in deduction, you prove that P of A is true. That is, you prove your base case. Uh, and then step two, you assume that P of K is true, and you prove that P of K plus 1 is also true. This is like a separate proof in your proof. Okay, so you're going to do something like if P of K is true, then P of K plus 1 is true. You're going to prove that step. And that's called your induction step. This is the induction part. Okay. Uh, if we do this, then you ha will have proved the universal statement. Okay, so let's go to an example. Uh, let's prove that for every integer n bigger than or equal to 0, n times n plus 1 is even. Now, we've proved this type of thing on like your test. Um, we proved it for every integer, uh, n times n plus 1 is even. Uh, but this is a good example. It is too quick to write down. Uh, you'll be able to rewatch it. I know, I, I can't write all this out by hand. Um, because I can't type, I can't write with the mouse very well. Uh, but this PowerPoint's available online and you'll be able to see this again, but I'll go a little bit slower. Okay, so <clears throat> I want to prove for any integer n bigger than or equal to zero, n times n plus one is even. Uh, so our starting point is going to be n at zero, and we're gonna try to prove that n times n plus one is even. So what are we gonna do? First we show p of zero is true, oh, I'm sorry, you're going to let p of n be the sentence n times n plus 1 is even, and you're going to prove that p of 0 is true. That's the first step. That's your base case. So you're going to plug in 0 for n and show that that is even. So 0 times 1 plus 0, you'll show that's even. This is obviously even because it's, you know, just 0. Base cases are usually really easy. Okay, then you're going to move on to your induction step. So you're going to show that for each integer k bigger than or equal to 0, because you're starting at 0, if p of k is true, then p of k plus 1 must also be true. So that is, we're going to assume that k times k plus 1 is even. Even though we haven't proved it, we're just going to assume that it's even. Okay, And we're going to use that information to show that k plus 1 times k plus 2 is also even. So just to be very clear, we want to show p of k plus 1 is true. That is, we plug in k plus 1 into this right here. So if we plug in k plus 1, we would get k plus 1 times k plus 1 plus 1 which is just k plus 1 times k plus 2. Okay, so this is what we're going to uh, need to prove. We're going to need to prove that this is also even. All right, any questions so far? Is it clear the steps that we're going to take uh, for this argument? Okay, so <clears throat> let's do the actual proof. <clears throat> so prove the thing we just talked about. We're going to prove it by induction. So it's always helpful to say what you're going to do. Uh, so starting off proof, I'm saying we're going to prove this by induction. So we're going to let P of n be the statement n times n plus 1 is even. Step 1, we need to show that P of 0 is true. So you write down, if n equals 0, you plug in 0 to this statement. 0 times 0 plus 1, ooh, that's a mistake, is 0. Since 0 is even, p of 0 is true. Right? 0 is an even number. So we proved our base case. We proved that p of 0 is a true statement. All right, so now to the induction part. We need to show that for each k bigger than or equal to 0, if p of k is true, then p of k plus 1 is true. So, as we always do with a conditional statement, if p, then q, we assume this spot. So we're going to assume p of k is true uh, for some integer k bigger than or equal to 0, because that's what k is. 
All right, then that means that k times k plus 1 is even. We're assuming that k times k plus 1 is even. And what do we know about even numbers? That just means it equals k times k plus 1 is equal to 2j for some integer j. So this is the very critical piece of information that we're going to have to use uh, later on. k times k plus 1 equals 2j. All right, so remember what we're trying to show. We want to show k plus 1 times k plus 2 is even. This is what we want to show. And we all know how to show things are even, right? We write it as 2 times something. So we're going to look at k plus 1 times k plus 2 and see if we can write it as 2 times something. So here we have k plus 1 times k plus 2. Um, I distributed it in a certain way. I didn't FOIL out the entire thing. I distributed uh, this entire term to each spot, right there and right there. Okay. So when you distribute that, you get k times k plus 1 plus 2 times k plus 1, right? Expanding the k plus 1 term. Okay. Now, why did I do that? Uh, well, I need to, like I said, I need to use that this information, that k times k plus 1 is equal to 2j. And since I distributed it this way, I can make a substitution right here. k times k plus 1 is just 2j, right? So I'm going to substitute k times k plus 1 with 2j. So since k times k plus 1 is 2j, I make the substitution. <clears throat> now I need to, again, I still need to write this as 2 times something. So I went ahead and distributed this 2 and got 2j plus 2k plus 2. And again, to show something is even, you write it as 2 times an integer. So we've written k plus 1 times k plus 2 as 2 times an integer. And that means that k plus 1 times k plus 2 is even. Even. So we showed that if k times k plus 1 is even, then k plus 1 times k plus 2 is even. And that's it. This proves the statement. So by induction, we're done. Uh, is there any questions about any steps here? I'll wait probably about. 20 seconds if you guys want to write anything, or you can just chime in with your mic. Why do you have to make sure that the base case is true? Uh, you have to make sure that the base case is true because in the induction step, you're saying if if p of k is true, then I'm oh sorry, then p of k plus one is true, right? <clears throat> if you don't ever prove a base case, uh, you'll never know if this actually was ever true, right? So what this does, what induction does, is that we show that p of 0 is true, right? So check mark for p of 0. And then we say, okay, if p of k is true, we show that if p of k is true, then p of k plus 1 is true. That means that, for example, if p of 0 is true, then p of 1 is true. So we've then proved that p of 1 is true. And then we know that if p of 1 is true, then p of 2 is true. So we prove that p of 2 is true. And you can see the pattern. Since p of 2 is true, that means p of 3 is true. It's kind of like an entire falling stack of dominoes, and so on and so forth. So you need a starting point so that you can, or you need to prove your base case so that you can apply the induction step. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question? OK, great, great. Uh, is there any other questions?
All right, I'm going to. All right, I'm going to move on then. <clears throat> so, next example. I want to prove that for every integer n bigger than or equal to zero, four to the n minus one is divisible by three. Four to the n minus one is divisible by three. Okay, <clears throat> so we're going to prove this by induction. So we're going to let p of n be the statement 4 to the n minus 1 is divisible by 3. The first thing that we have to prove is that this statement holds for our base case, and our base case is 0. So we need to show p of 0 is a true statement on its own. So let's show that p of 0 is true. If n is 0, then 4 to the 0 minus 1 is 0, right? Because 4 to the 0, anything to the 0, is 1. So 1 minus 1 is 0. Since 0 is divisible by 3, 0 is divisible by 3, that means that p of our base case is true. p of 0 is true. So we've proved our base case. So we have a starting point uh, down. Next is the induction step. We need to show that for each k bigger than or equal to 0, if p of k is true, then p of k plus 1 is true. So, like every proof, we say assume p of k is true for some integer k bigger than or equal to 0. So, if p of k is true, that means that 4k minus 1 is divisible by 3. That's what we are kind of like assuming, right? That's what our assumption is. 4 to the k minus 1 is divisible by 3. That means, and let's remember what being divisible by 3 is, if 3 divides uh, some number x, that means that x is equal to 3k for some integer k. So, if 4 to the k minus 1 is divisible by 3, that means 4 to the k minus 1 is equal to 3j. And obviously this is a different k. Is equal to 3j for some integer j. Right? Just by the definition of divisibility. Now this step that I did here, uh, it wouldn't be immediately clear that you need to do this, but I went and wrote it here. We'll use this in a minute. All I did is I added 1 to both sides. So that means that 4 to the k is equal to 3j plus 1. Okay? So I just solved for 4 to the k. And again, we'll see why uh, this is much easier to work with in a minute. Okay, so rem let's remind ourselves what we're trying to show. We're trying to show, we want to show that p of k plus 1 is true. So we want to show that 4 to the k plus 1 minus 1 is divisible by 3. So we want to show that we can write 4 to the k plus 1 minus 1 is equal to 3 times some integer. This is what we want to do. Okay, this is what we want to show. 4 to the k plus 1 minus 1 is equal to 3 times an integer. So, let's look at 4 to the k minus 1. 4 to the k minus 1, uh, I've written it as 4 times 4 to the k minus 1. Now, why was I able to do this? Uh, let's remember that x to the a plus b is equal to x to the a times x to the b. That's how uh, addition with exponents work. So here I had 4 to the k plus 1. So I split it out as 4 to the k times 4 to the 1. So hopefully uh, that makes sense. Now, <clears throat> it would be really tempting for a lot of people, I think, to take this right here and say, hey, look, there's 4 to the k minus 1. But there is not, you cannot substitute this. This is like, these are attached to each other. It's 4 times 4 to the k minus 1. So you can't make the substitution here. Uh, but what you can do is you can take this substitution right here, 4 to the k equals 3 j plus 1 and 
substitute 4 to the k. So we're going to replace 4 to the k with 3j plus 1. So we still have this 4 here. This 4 to the k becomes 3j plus 1 with parentheses. Be very careful. And then the minus 1 is still sitting out front. Okay, so we've replaced 4 to the k with 3j plus 1. Uh, now we can just distribute. We got actually rid of the exponents. This is really easy to simplify. Uh, distributing the 4 to each term gives us 12j right here. And then we have 4, and then minus 1 gives us 3. So we end up with 12j plus 3. Uh, we've been doing a lot of algebra, so let's remind ourselves what we're trying to do. We're trying to write 4 to the k plus 1 as 3 times an integer. So let's pull out a 3 from here. Pull out a 3, and we get 3 times 4j plus 1. So we've written 4 to the k minus 1 as 3 times an integer. And that means that 3 divides 4 to the k plus 1 minus 1. So 4 to the k plus 1 minus 1 is divisible by 3. So by induction, we are done. So I will uh, again take a step back. Uh, any questions? The question is, I don't understand how this is different with universal statements. Um, I, I don't think I understand your question. What do you mean how this is different than a universal statement? And you use induction to prove universal statements. Um, I don't, I can't think of a way immediately how to prove this statement. I can't think of a way to, of how to prove this statement without using induction. Um, I probably could. There's there's a way to prove this statement without induction. Um, but I think, in my opinion, induction would be the easiest way to prove this statement. Um, so you use induction to prove universal statements. It's a method of proving. Uh, does that does that answer your question, or did you have something else that uh, you meant? Right, in what case do you use induction? Uh, <clears throat> so you will generally use induction when you're trying to prove a universal statement that has a starting point. So here we're starting at n being 0, and we're trying to prove from n. It's true for n 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So whenever you have a starting point and you're trying to prove like an infinitely many uh, numbers past it, that's when you use induction. Like dominoes, like when you have a trail of dominoes, right? When you have a starting point and you're trying to prove everything starting from here over. So here we start at zero. We're trying to, we're trying to show that it's true for zero, one, two, three, four, five, all the way up to infinity. Uh, and induction works uh, wonders for these types of questions. Does that answer your question? Okay. Uh, any other questions? Okay, uh, let's move on to the third example of this type. 
I would like to prove that for every integer n bigger than or equal to zero, so again, we're starting at zero, it just happens that all of these uh, problems start at zero, uh, that two to the n is less than or equal to n plus one factorial. Uh, let's remind ourselves what factorial means. If we have four factorial, that's just equal to four times three times two times one. Right. Factorial just means you multiply every positive integer less than or equal to that number. So, I say that 2 to the n is less than or equal to n plus 1 factorial whenever n is bigger than or equal to 0. So, let's just prove it. Let's just uh, go at it and see what happens. Alright, <clears throat> so, let p of n be the statement. 2 to the n is less than or equal to n plus 1 factorial. first case, we need to show that our base case is true, that p of 0 is true. So we plug in 0 to this equation and see if this inequality holds. Uh, let's see, let's look at 2 to the 0, the left side right here. 2 to the 0 is 1, okay. What if we plug in 0 here, we get 0 plus 1 factorial, which is just 1 factorial, and 1 factorial also equals 1. So 1 is less than or equal to 1, therefore p of 0 is true. So we've proved our base case. Next up, we want to show that for each k bigger than or equal to 0, if p of k is true, then p of k plus 1 is also true. So assume that p of k is true for some integer k bigger than or equal to 0. Then that means that 2 to the k is less than or equal to k plus 1 factorial. This is our induction step. This is our induction hypothesis. So we'll be using this information in our argument. So <clears throat> let's remind ourselves what we want to show. We want to show that 2 to the k plus 1 is less than or equal to k plus 1 plus 1 factorial. So k plus 2 factorial. This is what we would like to show. OK. So let's look at 2 to the k plus 1 and show that it's less than or equal to k plus 2 factorial. So here's 2 to the k plus 1. Uh, again, by the properties of exponents, I can split this out as 2 times 2 to the k. right? Um, and here, look, I have 2 to the k right here. And I know that 2 to the k is less than or equal to k plus 1 factorial. So I know, let's see, since 2 to the k is less than or equal to k plus 1 factorial. Since this is true, this is what I'm assuming is true, I know that 2 times 2 to the k is less than or equal to 2 times k plus 1 factorial, right? So that means 2 times 2 to the k is less than or equal to k plus 1 factorial. So as we go down, it's going to be equals, less than, and then we'll have more operators here. So this means that 2 to the k plus 1 is less than or equal to 2 times k plus 1 factorial. Oh, why did I make that 1 so long? Oh, well. I don't know how to undo lines. Okay, so 2 to the k plus 1 is less than or equal to 2 times k plus 1 factorial. Remember, I'm trying to show 2 to the k plus 1 is less than or equal to k plus 2 factorial. So, hmm. I have this k plus 1 factorial. I know by properties of factorials that if I have k plus 2 times k plus 1 factorial, this is equal to k plus 2 factorial, right? We learned this uh, last class k plus 2 times k plus 1 factorial, you can just combine together. It's just all k plus 2 factorial. So this 2, right, I'm going to change this to k plus 2, but how can I do that? Well, I know that k is bigger than or equal to 0. Okay, so 0 is less than or equal to k, right? That's part of my assumption. This means if I add 2 to both sides, that 2 is less than or equal to k plus 2, right? So that means that this 2, I can write 
as it's less than or equal to k plus 2. So I can replace this too with a k plus 2 as long as I use a less than or equals to symbol. Right? In the exact same way how I replaced this 2 to the k with the k plus 1, but I did less than or equal to. This 2 is less than or equal to k plus 2, so this whole thing is less than or equal to k plus 2 times k plus 1 factorial. So that means 2 to the k plus 1 is less than or equal to k plus 2 times k plus 1 factorial. Uh, now we're going to use this property right here. This is just k plus 2 factorial. So we just showed that this 1 is less than or equal to k plus 2 factorial, which is what we wanted to show. So by induction, we are done. Um, I know there's some weird steps in this problem, so if there's any uh, questions, uh, ask now. Okay, it looks like there's uh, nobody typing, so we will move on. <clears throat> Let's talk about summations. So this is a pretty, uh, not popular is not the right word, but it's a pretty, uh, I think it's a lot harder to understand on Island class because it's quicker. Yeah, it's going to be harder, absolutely, um, unfortunately. Is there any questions that you guys had on this. Okay. Okay, so <clears throat> there's a, a question that's that was asked uh well this the story uh is this guy named Frederick Gauss. Maybe some of you have heard of Gauss before. Maybe Gaussian elimination or anything like that. Uh, Frederick Gauss was in uh, elementary school, and he was uh, he acted up, up a lot in class. Um, so the teacher uh, told him to add up all the numbers. He was acting out, so the teacher said, "Okay, your punishment is you need to add up all the numbers between one and a hundred. You know, thinking that." it would take him, you know, 30 minutes to do that. Because imagine trying to do 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5, and so on and so forth. Um, and he got the answer in, like, I don't know. The story is, like, less than a minute. He, fe he told her the answer. Um, and it's because there's actually, he was able to figure out a formula for adding up all the numbers between 1 and whatever you want. So we're going to investigate the same problem. So what is the sum of the first like 10 integers, or the first 100? Let's investigate. So the sum of the first 1 integers is just 1, right? 1 is just equal to 1. Uh, 1 plus 2, that's equal to 3. Uh, 1 plus 2 plus 3 is 6. 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 is 10. 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 is 15. Um, and you could keep going on, right? So it's kind of like factorials, but with adding. So there is a pattern going on here. First we get 1, then we get 3, then we get 6, then we get 10, and then 15. So is there a general formula that we could figure out to find the sum of the first, you know, however many integers you want? And it turns out you can. Um, and I'm just going to give you the formula, and then we're going to prove it. Okay? The sum of the first n integers is given by this formula. 
1 plus 2 plus 3 plus whatever to n, right, the sum of the first n integers, can be given by n times n plus 1 over 2. That's it, right? So um, let's see if this formula works. Uh, we did it by hand. 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 is 15. It should also be that if we plug in 5 to this formula, we get 15. So let's see. Uh, if we plug in 5 to that formula, 5 times 5 plus 1 over 2 is equal to 5 times 6 over 2. This is 30 over 2, which is 15. So it checks out. So it, it, it at least definitely works for 5. Um, and it turns out it works for everything. So if you were trying to add up all the numbers between 1 and 100, eh, just plug in 100 in here. It's just 100 times 101 over 2. And that's equal to, in case you're curious, 5,050. So really cool formula. I always thought it was super interesting. Uh, if you first ever, if you have a problem one day where you're trying to find out uh, the sum between 1 and 30, eh, just plug in 30 times 31 over 2, and then you're done. No need to do one by one on a calculator. So let's go ahead and prove this formula. And obviously, since this is an induction uh, class, we'll be proved by induction. We want to prove for any integer n bigger than or equal to 1, the sum from 1 to n is equal to n times n plus 1 over 2. Okay, so induction. Here, notice that our base case is now going to be 1 instead of 0, right? So we're starting at 1 now instead of 0. Okay, so p of n is going to be the equation, the sum of 1 through n equals n times n plus 1 over 2, okay? Base case, show that p of 1 is true. So if n equals 1, the sum of the first 1 integers is just 1, right? So the sum of... 1 through n, when n is just 1, is just 1. Uh, this thing, if you plug in 1, you get 1 times 2 over 2, which is just 1 as well. So this side is 1, this side is 1, and so p, is, p of 1 is true. So our base case is true. All right, now let's move on to our induction step. We need to show that for each integer, k bigger than or equal to 1, if p of k is true, then p of k plus 1 is also true, as we do with every induction step. So, assume that p of k is true for some integer k bigger than or equal to 1, because we're starting with 1. Uh, that means that the sum of 1 through k, we're going to assume, is in fact equal to k times k plus 1 over 2. Okay, so this is the important information we'll be using we need to show that p of k plus 1 is also true. So we need to show that 1 plus 2 plus 3 all the way up to k plus 1 is equal to the same thing we plug in k plus 1 in this formula. k plus 1 times k plus 2 over 2. Okay, so this is our goal. This is what we want to show. Okay, now let's look at this side and show that it equals, let's look at the left side and show that it equals the right side. So 1 plus 2 plus 3 all the way up to k plus k plus 1 is equal to the same thing. I just added some brackets right here. All right, 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus k plus k plus 1. So I'm being very clear uh, that I have brackets here. And I'm going to take this and make a substitution. Since the sum of 1 through k is k plus 1, or k times k plus 1 over 2, I'm going to replace the sum of 1 through k with k times k plus 1 over 2. So you're just making that substitution. Uh, and then we still have this k plus 1 right here. All right, now. Uh, we're going to get a common denominator and combine these fractions. Remember, our goal is to get this guy right here. We're trying to get k plus 1 times k plus 2 over 2. Okay, so if we do that, I skipped a lot of steps, so let me go ahead and do that uh, over here at top. Uh, k plus 1 
uh, so k times k plus 1 over 2 plus uh, k plus 1. I want these to have a common denominator, so I'm going to multiply it by 2 on the top and the bottom. 2 k plus 1 over 2, right? So now I have a common denominator. If I were to expand these out, there are quicker ways to do this, but this is the most direct or obvious way. If I were to expand these out, I would get k squared plus k right here over 2 plus I would have 2k plus 2 over 2 and then that gives me this. I have k squared k plus 2k is 3k and then I still have this 2. So I have k squared plus 3k plus 2 all over 2. All right, so it almost looks like this guy. Uh, we do have the divided by 2 on the bottom, but up top it looks like it's factored and we're not factored. So let's factor this. What are two numbers that multiply to get 2 and add to get 3? Just use your favorite factor method. This is mine. Uh, and the numbers that work are 1 and 2. All right, 1 times 2 is 2. 1 plus 2 is 3. So I can factor this as k plus 1 times k plus 2 all over 2. So I showed the sum of the first k plus 1 integers equals this. And that's what we wanted to show. So we're done. Okay, uh, pause for questions. All right, then we'll move on to our last example, and then we're done for today. Example five. All right, it's a doozy. Let's prove that for any integer n bigger than or equal to zero, the sum from i equals zero to n of r to the i is equal to this fraction right here, r to the n plus one minus one over r minus one. So let's uh, r could be any real number uh, as long as it's not equal to 1. So let's remind ourselves about summation notation. What does this mean? This is a summation notation. How would this look in expanded form? Well, we're starting with i being 0 and we go to n. So we plug in i equals 0 first and we get r to the 0. And then to the summation we do plus. Then plug in i equals 1. This is r to the 1 plus r squared plus, and you keep going until you get to r to the n. Okay, so that's what this means right here. r to the 0 plus r to the 1 plus r to the 2 plus all the way up to r to the n. This is going to equal this fraction right here. So let's prove it. We're going to prove it by induction. It's a universal statement with a starting point, so induction is a prime candidate. Let p of n be the equation, again, just this guy. Okay. We need to show that our base case is true, so we start with n being 0 and see if it works. So if we plug in 0 to the left side of the equation, we get i from 0 to 0 of r to the i. That's just one term, that is i being 0. So it's just r to the 0. And anything to the 0 is 1. OK, so the left side of the equation would equal 1. The right side of the equation, if I plug in 0, I get r to the 0 plus 1 minus 1 over r minus 1. Um, yeah, r to the 0 plus 1 is just r. 
and I have minus 1. Bottom is still r, minus 1, and then these would cancel. The whole thing would cancel, and we just get 1. So the left side is 1, the right side is 1, so p of 0 is true. All right, induction step. We need to show that for any k bigger than or equal to 0, if p of k is true, then p of k plus 1 is also true. So let's assume that p of k is true for some integer k bigger than or equal to 0. All right, so if p of k is true, that means that if I plug in k to this equation, it is true. So we're going to assume we're going to assume that this is true. All right, let's remind ourselves of what we want to show. We want to show that this is true if we plug in k plus 1. So we want to show we want to show the sum went from i equals 0 to k plus 1 of r to the i is equal to r k plus 1 plus 1 is just k plus 2 minus 1 all over r minus 1. We want to show this. Okay, so let's look at this summation and see if we can get to here. So the sum from i equals 0 to k plus 1 of r to the i, uh, let's expand it out, right? I think it's easier to understand what's going on when you put it in expanded form. So this is just r to the 0 plus r to the 1 plus r to the 2, blah, 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 all the way up to r to the k plus 1. Well, <clears throat> let's look at just this guy right here. Put some parentheses around here. This is r to the 0 through r to the k, and then we have r to the k plus 1 trailing at the end. So if I put this back into summation form, just this part right here, putting this part back into summation form gives me this, right? Sum i equals 0 to k of r to the i, and then we still have the trailing r to the k plus 1. Okay, so look, over here, I have the sum i equals 0 to k of r to the i is equal to this fraction. So I'm going to make a substitution. I'm going to replace this summation with r to the k plus 1 minus 1 over r minus 1. And I've done that right here. And then, of course, we still have this r to the k plus 1 trailing at the end. Okay, uh, now it's just a matter of getting this into a single fraction. So I need to get common denominators uh, with this term and this term. So I need to multiply top and bottom of this term by r minus 1. So if I do that, this doesn't change, obviously. I just drop the parentheses. Uh, and this term, we have an r minus 1 times an r minus 1, or over r minus 1. And if I expand this out, like so, the first term is going to be r times r to the k plus 1. And we know from the previous examples, this is just r to the 1 times r to the k plus 1. So this is r to the k plus 2, right? The exponents just add. And then the second term is just r to the k plus 1, minus r to the k plus 1. So I have that. This first term hasn't changed, right? This first term hasn't changed. And I have r to the k plus 2 minus r to the k plus 1, all over r minus 1. Now, if I combine these two fractions, we get something that cancels. This r to the k plus 1 and this r to the k plus 1 cancel each other out. One's positive, one's negative. And what's left over? I have r to the k plus 2 right here and a minus 1. So in total, I have r to the k plus 2 minus 1 all over r minus 1, which is what I wanted to show, right? I wanted to show that the sum from i equals 0 to k plus 1 of r to the i is equal to r to the k plus 2 minus 1 over r minus 1. So by induction, we're done. We just proved it. Kind of feels, kind of feels like magic almost. It's like okay, we're done. 
It just feels so abrupt, but we did it. This proves it. <clears throat> so is there uh, any questions on this problem? Do we draw a square? Um, you should. Uh, unfortunately, Microsoft or PowerPoint doesn't have a nice little shortcut to add squares in the bottom right corner, so I just didn't put it. Put it. And again, you're supposed to put a square. If you don't, it's I would never take off of that. But technically, most math proofs have a square in the bottom right corner to say they're done with it. Is there any other questions? Okay, so I believe this ends the PowerPoint. I do want to go over one more thing that's going to be in the homework. So can you guys still see my, uh, my PowerPoint screen? Okay, great. Uh, one problem that I didn't mention uh, <clears throat> is you'll have a problem inside your homework that says something like compute compute something like uh, 2 plus 4 plus 6 plus 8 plus 10 plus 12 all the way up to like say 100 or something like that. Uh, the way that you handle these problems is if I'm sure you guys have all noticed, all of these are multiples of two, right? So if we're trying to compute this number, why don't I pull out a two? Do two times one plus two plus three plus all the way up to not 100, 50. All right, so we have. 2 times 1 plus 2 plus 3 all the way up to 50. I should have a plus there. Um, so it's just 2 times whatever this is. And we know that the sum of 1 to n, now that we know the formula, is n times n plus 1 over 2. This is the sum of 1 through 50. So this is 50, sorry, not plus, times 51 over 2. Uh, let's see, these 2's would cancel, and whatever 50 times 51 is, I actually don't know what that is off the top of my head. So this is a calculator, 50 times 51, and you would get 2,550. Okay, so you'll see a problem like that in your homework. It, it won't be multiples of two. I think it's like multiples of something else, maybe sixes or threes. I can't recall, but that's how you do a problem like this. Okay, you factor out something. Notice it's just the sum of one through something, and then use that formula. Okay, so I appreciate everyone that uh, stayed on listened. I know that this is not the most engaging way of teaching, um, but unfortunately, it is what we got. So are there uh, any questions? And you're all welcome to leave if you'd like. Uh, if there's anybody that has a question, feel free to uh, stay back and uh, and ask. Oh, Jake, I don't speak that. Did we take attendance? Uh, no, there's no way to take attendance. So what I'm going to do for attendance is just everyone gets credit for the rest of the semester. Nothing else I can do. So <laughs> you'll get like 10 free or uh, yeah, like 10 free attendance grades. Or maybe I'll make attendance. On, I don't know. You certainly won't get uh, docked for not coming to these. All right, guys, everyone who's leaving, have a great day. Thank you very much. So I'll see you all uh, Wednesday.
Oh, 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 oh.